Hello everybody and welcome back to the Fortress of Solitude. Today we're going to be checking out the next installment of Beast World in Beast World Issue 2 by Tom Taylor and Ivan Reyes. The world goes crazy as Beast Boy's Starro spores spread across the world, infecting millions and turning them into monstrous animal people. And it's up to the Titans and the world's other heroes to fight them off and dodge becoming infected themselves. After a great first issue that did a lot of the setup of the plot, I was hoping that that would continue in the next few issues but nothing really moves forward all that much this issue. Instead, Taylor focuses in on the heroes battling the spore threat and fleshing out a few of the specifics regarding the parasite infecting them and how it works, kicking things off with a real awesome Animal Man sequence that shows the effects of millions of new creatures just instantly being available to the red and instantly joining the red and that's not really a good thing as Buddy can't process all of that information at once and it seemingly drives him insane. Black Adam is the biggest threat the world faces at the moment beyond the Garo and we find that he is in Kandak and he is killing his people left and right so Donna and Starfire are sent to combat him and save the people of Kandak. Nightwing meanwhile reteams with Batman to help get as many people to safety in Gotham as they can, and it's here that Batman ends up being infected. Taylor uses this opportunity to do a few things. Firstly, reaffirm Dick's role as the leader of the Titans and the leader of the team that is the sole protectors of Earth instead of the Justice League, since the Justice League no longer exists. He gets a good moment before Batman turns that helps gird Dick into his role as this leader and his mission to fix this and save the world. Secondly, Taylor uses Batman's infection to explain the infection a little bit and explain that the spore isn't just just puppeting these people, it's changing them from inside out and it changes Batman into a wolf man type being. And not only that, we also learn that he keeps all of Batman's skills and none of his restraint. So not only is Nightwing fighting a blood crazed Batman, but also one who knows how to fight and doesn't have any restraint, which makes him a big, big threat. I think this was quite a good way to do it, it sort of separates things off from how Taylor handled other stuff like the deceased, how when they would become zombies they would become kind of mindless killing machines, whereas here the threat is even more personal for the people that have to fight these animal beings because the person they loved and care about is still there and still present and they have to worry about hurting them in doing so. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays into how Dick deals with this Batman. I know he has a story in the upcoming Beast World Gotham tie-in book, so I'm looking forward to seeing how their relationship goes now that Batman is a wolfman who cannot control himself. Walla Meemol basically orders the president to give her something called the Bureau of Sovereignty, which will give her complete control over the country and allow her to finally take out the heroes. This is something new in DC, I've never heard of this Bureau of Sovereignty, and it makes me wonder if maybe it might be tied into what was happening in the Wonder Woman book by Tom King because in that book she was fighting a being called the Sovereign who is in control of all of America. He's like America's king and you know similar names it might just be a coincidence thing that happens all too often across these big events but I like to think there is some sort of connection between these two especially because both the Bureau of Sovereignty and what we learn about it in this issue and what the Sovereign is in that Wonder Woman book are essentially the same things, something that can control all of America. If they aren't related though, I do find it funny that two people named Tom came up with basically the same concept. Amanda Waller's whole role here is weird since we saw with Joshua Williamson's setup for Dawn of DC that she was setting things up to take the heroes out, yet Dr. Hate messing with Beast Boy and this entire event doesn't really seem under her control, it doesn't seem to be like what she was aiming for. It's even more confusing when you go into the tie-ins, especially the first two tie-ins, specifically the Waller Rising tie-in, where it claims that Dr. Hate has gone rogue and what he did with Beast Boy wasn't something he was really meant to be doing, yet here Waller is just acting like nothing happened and Dr. Hate is with her and helping her and all that sort of stuff. It's almost like that tie-in doesn't matter, which if you heard my review on that tie-in it felt like there was already a pitch for those heroes in that book and they just bolted pieces of Beast World storyline into it and it didn't really all fit but they just kind of pushed it out and just hoped no one would actually notice. It's almost like they don't 
don't really know what to do with her, especially with an event of this size. Usually when you see Amanda Waller, she's in the background controlling things from the shadow. She's never really out and about talking to the president to try and get whole control of the country. And, you know, you never see her agents out and about like Dr. Haight and Peacemaker are. So it's, it's very strange what they're doing with her and they're trying to make her something that she really is not since she has quite a niche with the Suicide Squad, Task Force X and all those guys, and she works well in that niche. But now that they're moving her into, you know, the big bad of a big summer event, it doesn't really fit with the character all that well. Not only that, but if you are to actually take her out of this event, like take her role out of this event and she's not any part of it, nothing changes. The event would still happen as it's happening now. She's not directly responsible for any of this. She's just a bystander that's just been caught off guard like the rest of the heroes have been. And it's just strange how they are using her in this book. And I would have thought there would have been a little bit more weight to what she is doing, but so far she hasn't had much to do. Ivan Reyes again delivers just some top-notch artwork here. I love all his designs for the animal people heroes that we're getting. We got like a lion Black Adam which is really strange. I talked about this on the Comic Multiverse podcast that it's really strange that he is a lion or a tiger instead of something like an Anubis dog or something to do with his culture. It's really strange and it's even more strange when you see other people who will be turning into things that they are very much like. Like we see killer croc turn into an actual crocodile and certain heroes turn into things that their character actually is and then we have people like batman who turns into like wolf man dog thing instead of what you would assume a giant bat and nightwing eventually will turn as well and he turns into like a fox it's very strange how they're doing all of these transformations where some make sense in the character and who the character is while others are just i will change him into a wolf or a dog or a cat or something it's really quite strange uh, but the art still looks fantastic in all of these. I, I really like the designs on them. They're really quite cool. How Ivan is incorporating the costumes into these changes is really awesome as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing what other weird and wonderful creatures he has in store for us over the course of this event. Beast World issue 2 kind of stopped the plot a little bit just to explain some of the specifics behind the spores and what their deal is and how they go about changing people, which I'm glad it did and glad it got like the specifics and how these things work laid out pretty well, though I do wish we got the plot moving a little bit more, especially in Amanda Waller's camp, considering that she is meant to be sort of the big mastermind behind all of this, or you know, someone who is has a hand in what is happening here, yet she's treated like she isn't, and she is treated almost like a secondary character that doesn't really exist, so I'm a bit disappointed in that, and hopefully as the book ticks on, we'll get more of an explanation of her role in it, but it's just very disappointing. All of the teasing and all of the little preludes we got with Waller through Dawn of DC from other different writers is kind of a waste now. I'm going to give this issue a 7 out of 10 so check it out if you're already reading it. If not maybe just wait for a couple of issues and just kind of binge a couple of them together. Maybe they might read a bit better once you can read one after the other. 